Hello, grade 12 psychology class. Welcome back to another lecture. We have lesson six, perception part two, big shock around the title. Um, but here we go. We're going to talk about some different aspects of perception. Uh, the first one is we're going to talk about subliminal messages. So subliminal messages are a brief auditory or visual, visual message that is presented below the absolute threshold. Uh, essentially below the threshold that fi um, that 50 percent of people will notice it so less than 50 percent chance that it will be perceived by people is a subliminal message this guy falsely claimed one time that he had flashed subliminal messages to moviegoers and it increased the sale of popcorn 58 percent and coke sales 18 percent and based on this guy's false claim the fcc the Federal Communications Commission in the United States banned this practice of sending subliminal messages or flashing something on the screen. Apparently, this guy claimed he flashed something at uh, one three thousandth of a second every once in a while across the screen, and this rose. But um, there are lots of factors that could cause these to rise, like the temperature. Uh, in the theater made people go get coke and they also wanted uh, popcorn or whatever it might be um, the FCC condemned this practice anyway even though this seemed to be a lie so uh, subliminal messages um, or even if it's possible for people to perceive this information at vo very low levels of intensity there's no clear evidence that these weak often limited messages would be more powerful in influencing people than conscious messages. There's, it's really been hard to study these, I guess, uh, but there's no evidence so far that these messages actually um, affect people uh, in any real way. Uh, they may be attempted. You may notice uh, some attempts at like product placements and stuff, but that's um, less subliminal than people will notice 50% of the time. Uh, it's there to be perceived. Um, nevertheless, many people believe that subliminal advertising is powerful. There's, it might be, there's just no evidence so far that it is. So there's key point one, everyone. Good for us. Key point two is with depth perception. And we're going to talk about kind of this with sight uh, as a theme over the next couple of points. When ocular and binocular, we talk about sight uh, for the most part here. So depth per perception, we talked about this a little bit already. But it's the ability to recognize distances and three-dimensionality. Uh, and this ability develops in infancy, but we can always you know, train it to be better with practice. Uh, so psychologists have placed infants on large tables and found that they will most likely not crawl over the edge. Um, that means that they have some depth perception. They see that the floor is, in fact, farther away than the edge of the table. Uh, therefore, they like don't want to crawl off of it. Uh, from this observation, it's possible to infer that infants do in fact have depth perception. So it's possible to infer that it's something that infants do develop uh, when they are very young. Um, we have monocular cues. So monocular cues are cues that you can uh, have with only one eye. And they're a lot more common than two, which is why having only one eye is not super great, but also it doesn't hinder you too bad. So monocular depth cues are cues that can be used with a single eye, uh, essentially the size of an object. If it's bigger, it will be nearer. If it's smaller, it's farther away. Uh, whoa, sorry. The relative height, uh, objects that appear farther away from another object on a higher, uh, are higher on your plane of view. Um, so like you can see like relative size of person in a building, whether they're close together based on their height. Interposition or overlapping of images. So if something is standing in, someone is standing in front of someone else, you know that they're closer compared to someone that's farther away, like they would be covered up. Um, if you can see an object in its entirety, it's closer than the one whose outline is interrupted by the other object. When I was wrapping volleyball, I always used this. You know, if the line disappeared or not, um, that would like tell me where the where the ball would land. Uh, or had landed, sorry. Uh, so these are all monocular cues, cues we can um, use with only one eye. Uh, we can also use lights and shadows. Man, that's a monocle. 
We can also use lights and shadows to yield information about an object's shape and size, its location in relative to where we are. If we know all the shadows are, for, are facing that way, we can see if something has a shadow, that there is something in front of it. Uh, brightly lit objects appear closer while objects in shadows are always farther away. Uh, Bob Ross will tell you that. Oh boy, will he tell you that. Uh, texture density and gradient. So if you can see lots of detail, that means it's closer. If you can't see very much detail, it's farther away. Again, thank you very much, Bob Ross. And you only need one eye to tell you all of this stuff. You can perceive texture density and shadows and light information with just one eye. Um, motion parallax. So I'm going to show you a picture and then come back to this one. But essentially, let's say you're this dude driving in a car and you're going this way, this way, this way. The trees are going to be moving backward, but they're going to be moving backward a whole lot faster than the houses. The trees are going to go as you go by. And then you're going to see the houses and they'll go by slower. And then you can like observe the mountains in the background for a really long time. And that's motion parallax. Objects that are closer to you are going to move quicker when you move or when you turn your head compared to objects that are farther away. They're going to move slower uh, than uh, if you're moving or when you move your head. So another cue is motion parallax, the apparent movement of objects that occurs when you move your head from side to side. You can demonstrate motion parallax by looking um, towards two objects in the same line of vision. So essentially, like if you're watching this video right now in class, you can like look at two people across the room that are in the same line of you. And if you move your head back and forth, kind of like this, the near object will move more than the far object. That is how uh, you can decipher um, which one's farther away from you, which one's closer if you're not 100% sure. Uh, so you can try this at any time, but yeah, the closer one moves more than the farther one. Ooh, a picture again. And then we have linear perspective. Again, another monocular cue, single eye. Uh, essentially, when things get farther away, like a railroad track or a road, uh, they'll get closer together. So when you look at a long stretch of road or railroad tracks, it appears the sides of the road or tracks converge on the horizon. So we see them come together. And again, if you close one eye, you can still perceive that. It only needs one eye to see, and you can see where it is farther away compared to what's closer to you. So here we have a little diagram where we have binocular vision. So that's key point four. And this is the area in the orange where you can see with two eyes. And then we have the uh, area in the yellow, which is one le eye, the left eye, and then the right eye in the pink. Um, so the cue that we're going to talk about can only be used if you have two eyes that are in that field of vision. Uh, this is just a setup for somehow they sometimes they do tests. So they'll flash information over here and see if you can see it, or flash information over here and see if you can see it um, for some monocular cues. But here we're going to get into this part, the binocular part. So binocular depth, depth cues depend on the movement of both eyes. So ex for example, convergence is the process by which you go cross-eyed when you look at objects that are close to you. If I'm looking at my finger, I'm going to be cross-eyed or more cross-eyed than if I'm looking at something that's far away. And we can kind of have a little bit of a idea of how close something is based on where our eyes are pointing. And it doesn't take that much of a difference for us to perceive something that's far away. Even if I'm looking at my computer, it may look like my eyes are straight, but they are actually pointed inwards quite a bit. Um, so if I look at the house that's across the street, they are pointed a lot more straight, but even if there's a grain elevator or a mountain that's even farther away, they'd be even straighter. So these cues, um, even subtle differences, they can tell us a lot about where something is. So convergence is by how we turn our eyes inward to look at nearby objects. Uh, we also have retinal disparity, which we talked about previously. Uh, the difference of the pictures in your eyes, because you have two eyes. Um, gives uh, you an idea of how far away something is and the position of that object. So the brain interprets a large retinal disparity to mean that an object is close 
and a small retinal disparity to mean that an object is distant. If you are wondering about that still, again, ask me any time. Uh, throw up your hand if you're in class, or send me an email if you're at home. Um, I've asked lots and lots of questions. Um, but retinal disparity is about the different pictures that your eyes see and how you put that information together. Okay, you have your job, which obviously includes important terms, and then an assignment about depth cues. If you have questions, please let me know. But thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you soon.